are live from London. Now, today I'm honoured to be joined by four incredible actors from a hotly anticipated dramatisation of a disaster that shook the entire world. Here to tell us about Sky Atlantic and HBO's epic new series, Chernobyl, please welcome Jared Harris, Emily Watson, Paul Ritter, and Jesse Buckley! <laughs> welcome, welcome. Thank you guys for joining us on Build. Uh, before we get started, if you guys at home want to get involved and ask the guys a question, you absolutely can. You can tweet us at Build Series LDN or leave a comment below this video if you're watching live on Facebook. Guys, welcome to Build. It's lovely to have you. Thanks for having us. So this series Thanks. is highly anticipated by critics and um, by the public. What can you tell us about Chernobyl? Jared, let's start with you. Uh, it's a... It's a a gripping drama about um, heroism and self-sacrifice and uh, bureaucratic bungling and um, state suppression of the truth. Um, and Emily, what made you want to get involved in the series? What pulled you in? When you get a script like this that is just astonishing and page-turning and shocking and you immediately go, yes, I want to do this, how can I be part of it? Um, and and I also had some really great people attached to it already when I when, when I was sent it. So, um, yeah, it was not really a choice. The um, the cast and the lineup are absolutely stellar, and we have a trailer of um, what the series is all about. <laughs> Chernobyl, ladies and gentlemen, absolutely. It's, it's, it's an amazing watch, and episode one is so gripping, um, the, the explosion and the aftermath of that. How much of that was shot in, um, in CGI, Paul? Uh, the actual explosion? Yeah, just the, well, the series in general, but, but episode one, yeah. Um, hardly any of what I was involved in was, was CGI'd. It was all absolutely... It was filmed in a remarkable replica of the uh, Chernobyl Reactor 4 control room, which was uh, painstakingly reconstructed in a, in a carpet factory in Vilnius. And uh, so we played it absolutely for real. And we, we actually had two gentlemen with us who had spent their whole working lives uh, in an absolutely identical control room at the nuclear facility at Ignalina on, on Lithuanian territory. And they could look at every one of these pretend buttons and they knew exactly what it did. So, so for me, um, it, it was a very physical, tangible experience doing it. Um, is portraying such a, a huge you know, disaster that actually happened, does it put extra pressure on conveying your characters, uh, Jesse? Uh, and the authenticity of your characters. Yeah, I'd say it would. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, well, I and I, you know, from I can only speak for myself, but uh, Ludmilla is still alive, and um, I suppose I was definitely scared, <laughs> and that I wouldn't uh, tell her story as honestly as and as provocatively as as was needed to be told. Um, yeah. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your um, character, Emily, and her role in the tragedy? My character is uh, written in tribute to the many scientists who were involved in the aftermath of Chernobyl. And um, she is somebody who is um, a, a nuclear physicist from Belarus who detects, who, who kind of um, works out what's, what's happened and puts herself into that situation. She goes to Chernobyl and she becomes part of, part of the investigative team who have to really operate below the radar because mm. according to the state, there is n nothing is wrong, there is nothing to investigate. So there were a lot of people who had to work very covertly to get the truth out. And she's a lone female voice in a world of men that think that they know better. What was it like portraying uh, that character? And can you empathise with, with the, the character? Um, I, I guess my, my starting point was, was finding someone who's really, really tough. Um, <laughs> what, why are you laughing? <laughs> <laughs> what was it like being a lone woman with a bunch of men? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, um, it's true. Just like being on set. <laughs> no, no I, I was surrounded by um, extremely empathetic and very civilised human beings, which was very fortunate. Um, but yeah, f f playing a woman in that world, somebody who really is just wedded to science, and that is, that is her... 
um, raison d'etre is to find the truth and everything else doesn't matter. Um, I think you have to be somebody of very, very single-minded, single-purposed individual to do that. I'm not, I don't think it's something I could do that in a million years. Um, Jared, you play the reluctant could-be hero Valerie, who is the lead scientist and is thrown into this situation and has to try and, and sort it. Um, what does, can you just tell us about your, 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 um, your character and kind of what he had to go through? Yes, uh, Valerie Legasov, he's, he's a real person and his job was to go down there and uh, see if it had the, uh, what had happened. Um, and once they realize that it's the worst case scenario, try and figure out how you, uh, based, you know, how you put the lid back on, on uh, a, a melting uh, meltdown, nuclear reactor that's melting down. Um, and then there's a huge issue with the contamination as well, the, the surrounding area. So the, um, there's a whole series of problems mm. that they're facing. Um, uh, and it, uh, th there was there's real footage of him uh, a little bit. There's uh, stuff out there about him. Um, he has large was largely erased from the narrative by the Soviet state um, because he I guess he wouldn't do what they wanted him to do. Um, so there's you know there's there's a small amount of information out there. But our, our version of the character is slightly different from the historical version of the character in that um, Craig, he, he wasn't interested in, in scenes where you had him calling home to his wife and he just wanted the, the narrative to be propelled forward. So the real Legasov was married and he had a family, he has children, and, but they, they aren't in our story. Um, as you said, the Soviet Union kind of put a hush-hush on a lot of the, um, the details. How much research did, did you guys have to do um, for each of your roles? And what did you do? Well, there was a, an enormous resort res, uh, research resource made available to us by HBO. Craig Mason, who wrote the show, has an seemingly the most enormous brain and, and <laughs> sort of bottomless knowledge on this subject. Um, and so there was a lot of reading material. There was scientific material. There was also um, beautiful testimony from... There's, there's, a, um, there's a documentary about the character that Jesse plays, and there's a book, Voices from Chernobyl, which is a, really a spiritual treatise um, assembled from by, by incredibly, but, but, but it's sort of around and about the people who were there. Um, so th there were many, many different ways to go in terms of research. Um, I, mean, I guess everybody just took their own path, I mean, but it was a huge subject. So did you kind of have, did you do individual research, uh, research from the same kind of booklets or the same kind of, um, you know, the, 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 the information so that, that the executive producer gave they, you? They had a trove of research that they made available to all of us uh, online, videos, audio recordings, research material, books, recommendations to read, um, uh, I think some even some movies as well that they put yeah. out there for, you know, give, give an idea of period and stuff like that. Um, Paul, so your character, Antoli, was the assistant chief engineer in charge of the control room when the disaster hit. Um, and he was carrying out a, a routine test. So how culpable and how responsible do you think he was for what happened? And, and just talk us through that character playing he that. certainly um, bears his share of the responsibility. It's probably slightly... Uh, misleading to say it was a routine test. This was um, something that was wished for by, by the authorities at executive level. It was a test to see if the facility could carry on uh, functioning um, in the case of a power outage. Um, so if it could uh, carry on functioning essentially using electricity that it had already generated and stored in its turbo generator backup system. And um, what had happened is, is that the, uh, the executive level from on high, this request had been made of pretty much all of these um, almost identical nuclear facilities dotted around the Soviet territory. I think there are about a dozen of them with small generational differences, and, and Chernobyl was actually one of the most recent ones to be constructed. And tellingly, the management of every facility mm. said no. 
I, we do not advise that this goes ahead. The guys at Chernobyl who were a somewhat volatile um, management triumvirate um, with Dyatlov, the assistant, actually being far more qualified than his direct superior and a lot of tension in there, um, they looked at each other and said, yeah, um, leave it with us. And this was the fourth time they had attempted this test. And crucially, this time um, they, they tried to do it by bad luck, by bad timing, with, with a crew of people who had not been involved in any of the previous tests. So, but yes, it, it's probably right to say that, that Dyatlov, in his determination to push through this test, bear, bears um, a, a heavy load of the responsibility, yes. It's one of those things. Sorry, you go ahead. No, 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 after you. It's one of those things where it's like when you hear about a plane going down. It's it's a series of one yeah. in a million things that happened, and and it was it, so there was the test that was happening, but also it was the end of the month, and the factories had their production quotas to hit, and so they asked the plant managers not to to do the test. They had to cut the power. So they said, please don't cut the power because we we've got to run our factories late to hit our quotas. Cut it after midnight. So um, when they cut the power after midnight, a new shift came in, and that shift hadn't been trained. They didn't even know what the test was. Mm. So it's this whole series of things that build up towards... I mean, it wasn't just one guy pushing the wrong button. Sure, no, no, I know, I understand. I think in a, as you get deeper into the story, you begin to realise that there, are, there is information that the guys operating the plant were not privy to, and that yeah. once, it became, once it moved into extreme conditions for this reactor, then the, there were things they should have known about that they didn't. Yes, so that's is that's this that's series, is it ultimately a, a story of human error and fallibility, or is it one of resilience and strength, or something completely different? Or all of those? I think it's all of that. Yeah. yeah. Um, Jesse, can we talk about your character, Ludmilla, who is um, wife to one of the first firefighters who arrived on the scene? And I guess she symbolizes um, the, you know, and represents all of the victims. What was it like playing uh, that character and what was her kind of role um, in, the, in the tragedy? Um, yeah, I suppose uh, f in, within the series, she's kind of the voice of the civilians and the people on, on who, you know, saved the world and went into the, into the core selflessly to contain um, the, the damage from the explosion after the immediate effect. And, um, um, and for her story, it's one of blind, dangerous love, loss and grief and survival. Um, and I suppose playing somebody like that, you know, it, it's, it's such a unique kind of thing to grieve, you know, not, it, this doesn't happen. There, it's not like, it's not like war. Mm. It's a silent war, and and, and it, 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 you can It's not tangible. You can't see it. You can't. There's no buildings falling down. But the, what happens to the these firefighters? That the nightmare death that happens to them is um, like not even. You, it's so hard to even get your head around and not let alone your heart. So when you're kind of, when I was digging into where this might be within her, I, I, <laughs> I pulled a, a lot of things and, and tried to read as much as I could and, and look at her and see where it might be coming from. What was it like then when you were all on set together? And because you know this is quite a heavy um, production to kind of portray, isn't it? Was there moments of like raw and real emotion for all of you and for, so. and for the, for yeah. the cast and the and the <laughs> and even the extras on camera? <laughs> <laughs> But, but yeah, but it, are, were there kind of like moments of, of kind of like, you know, you're like, this actually happened, this is, this is real, or this was real? Yeah, well, there was like a few, because we were sh shooting in Lithuania and, and Ukraine, so, you know, even within the extras, this was something which is so relative to, you know, and relatable to them, and often on set, I, well, I don't know if you found that, but I found like it was the reality of it was spilling yeah. in on top of, of set and the extras were reacting to it in a very like personal way because it was true for them and it is still true today for them. It's not a historical event that happened. It's still happening and yeah. the consequences of this is still going on. There's grandchildren of Chernobyl being born with tumours because 
that it's it's been passed down through generation and that's the truth did you want to say something Emily I was just going to say that I got um, picked up by a taxi driver the other night who, and we got chatting about this and he said that he wore glasses because of Chernobyl he was Romanian and he was his mother was pregnant when it happened and he was they lived near to the Ukrainian border and he, uh, he, it's a birth defect that he mm. has from that time. And it's, you don't realise the reach of it. It's, I mean, it could have been a thousand times worse. They, they contained a secondary explosion in, through incredible heroism and bravery in the first few days after the accident. It could have, you know, four more reactors could have gone up, basically. Um, but even so, it's, it, you know, it, as Jesse says, it's an ongoing event. Mm. And a real parable for our times as well. Yeah. It's like what happens when you ignore the scientists. Yeah. Um, I just want to talk about the quality of this production because it's ever evident throughout from like the, the from the costumes, the CGI, the cast is incredible. Um, and it's all pulled together by uh, Johan Rank, the director. What is it like and what was it like working with him on, on set? Paul. <laughs> uh. It was fantastic working with Johan. He's uh, he's an extraordinary, um, yeah, charismatic man. He's a he's a big character. He's very very uh, articulate and imaginative, but also um, m makes very light uh, of the process. So uh, it's fun. He will come over in the middle of. Uh, my first experience on set was was doing the trial scene at which we were we were all gathered, and it was it was five days of, of very hard work for for all of us really, and uh, Johan would enliven it enormously, um, uh, but then nip over and have a quiet word uh, and just pick up on a detail of what you're doing, and ask you to do something with that. So. Um, I, I'm, Sure, I speak for everyone. Say so he he was a very very um, uh, perceptive and receptive person to to work with. And Craig Mazin is the writer and executive producer. Um, how involved is he in the process and on set? Is it, was he on set quite a lot? Was he a fountain of knowledge when you were trying to bring, bring your characters to life? Yes, very much so. I, I don't think he was there the entire time, but he was there a lot of the time. And he really was. You know, he has has it all in his head. And he was a, a, a very significant f resource for us as we were working. You know, if there was ever a question about a detail, he would be the guy to go to. But he also, you know, he was researching all the time and, and you know, checking detail checking and fact checking. And um, it was a very stimulating presence to have around because you, you know, you're, you feel like you have a, a responsibility to the material. Um, if you could describe this series in one word, what would it be? I'll, I'll go down the line and start with you. I know it's a tough one. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not one word, a couple of words. How would you describe it? A uh, uh, real nightmare. <laughs> God, actually, no. Yeah, that, that. <laughs> How would you describe the series to watch? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, can I change my answer? <laughs> <laughs> okay, Jared, let's start with you. <laughs> um, I would say that it's a, uh, I think that's what I said at the beginning, I think it's a, a, a really gripping story. Um, it's got tales of, of, of uh, her heroism from people who had no expectation of being remembered. Um, and it's also a sort of cautionary tale about, about, the um, the power of the state when it's no longer accountable to the truth to uh, to this population and um, and how damaging uh, an atmosphere of lies or this in, there's one specific lie in this tale that um, is actually the cause of the uh, the accident. That's more than a couple of words. It is, but I just decided. To <laughs> Emily, why why should people watch this series? I think it's pretty terrifying. I mean, in, in, in a good way. I think it's um, you you forget that you're watching real events. It, you know, in a way, it feels like you're watching a fiction because that couldn't possibly be true, but it is. Paul, can I go back to the one word thing? You go back uh, to the one word so thing. So uh, my one word, and um, possibly sounds a bit dry, and hopefully not too much of a turnoff, but I'd say educative. If I had to distill it down to one word, because you will 
learn an awful lot that you didn't know. Yeah, it, it, Greg's writing does make you feel smart just by listening to it. <laughs> Jesse. <laughs> It's still a tragedy to watch. <laughs> I'm sweating and I feel really <laughs> under pressure. Um, I, uh, well, it, the, it's provocative and um, it's the, it tells the, you know, the, the account that lies cost thousands and thousands of lives. And um, yeah. Thank you. Um, before we go, so this show is a Sky original for Sky Atlantic and Now TV. And with the, with the, you know, there's so many channels now, there's so much on demand and digital services. Do you think we have reached peak television or do you think there's more to come in, in, in terms of, you know, the kind of t the amazing television that we're, they're that we're churning out? Who would like to answer that one? I, I would say we have not reached it. Um, if you see, uh, that Apple TV stepped into the market, Disney stepped into the market, and there's there's going to be a, a race to create more content because um, you're going to have to provide a reason for people to resubscribe every month, and uh, and they they all gonna, they're all going to need big libraries. So I would say that there's going to be an even bigger surge of content within the next couple of years. Well, that's um, that can only mean more work, and more jobs for yeah, yes. for all of us. <laughs> more AO build sessions. Yes. <laughs> it's but it's like what turning on the telly now is like going to a really good bookshop, and there's something for everybody, which didn't used to be at all. And you know, long form television provides a way of you know, it's like a, reading a good novel. It provides a way of exploring a subject in a, in a much more profound and interesting way, and diverse and more supply, more demand. Guys, unfortunately, that's all we've got time for. But we've absolutely loved having you guys on Build, and best of luck with the series. Sadly, that is all we have time for the cast with the cast of HBO's Chernobyl. But you can watch it from tonight at 9 p.m. on Sky Atlantic and Now TV. We're back at 4:30 with the legendary Banana Rama, and that, my friends, is the kind of variety we like to deliver here on Build. But for now, give it up one more time for Jared, Emily, Paul, and Jesse. Yeah.